This is the last panel at the Rick Smith Memorial Hymposium stage, and we are grateful to you for being here. I'm Doug McVeigh, editor of Drug War Facts, calm and under control. Ah, they're so calm. And off here to my right, we have Steve Levine, Dave Sievers, Adam Eidinger, David Bronner, and Dave Piller. Happy Hempfest, everyone. Can you hear me? So since you last saw us, a lot has been going on. A lot has been going on. We have two bills in, the, uh, in Congress, right? Uh, let's see. On February 6th of this year, uh, the uh, House of Representatives introduced a, uh, uh, a hemp farm bill to legalize hemp farming. A week later, the Senate did the same thing. Um, we have gotten the support of not only the two Kentucky Senators, Rand Paul and Mitch McConnell, but also the uh, Speaker of the House, uh, John Boehner, and numerous other politicians. In um, a couple months ago, when the Farm Bill was before Congress, um, we had an amendment added to the Farm Bill, and we had to get a majority of the 435 members of the House of Representatives. And we won the battle 225 to 200. We had 225 congressmen, Congress people, voting to legalize hemp farming. It was beautiful. Beautiful. First time ever. Historic. But, you know, nothing is easy in the cannabis industry. So we, the, the, we became part of the Farm Bill. We were an amendment to the Farm Bill. It was a big deal. It's rare. They don't let that many in. There was hundreds or dozens or whatever amount of people wanting to add on to the Farm Bill. So we got on to the Farm Bill. The Farm Bill went to the, the full house or the full whatever and lost. So it will come up again and the hemp farm bill is still there. However, we're still, and we still got the two bills in, in the House of Representatives, one and one in the Senate. So we're very close. Uh, to give you an example, real briefly, we've been lobbying in California as well. This is the fourth time we've done it. We've three times have gotten the bill on the governor's desk. It's been vetoed. This year, we are going through, we're sailing through the legislative process. The California Assembly and the California Senate, we've had maybe half a dozen hearings and the full vote of the Senate, and there is not one dissenting vote. Which is amazing. 39 to zero in the California US Senate to legalize hemp farming. And all the hearings, all the hearings that we have uh, attended have, that have been about hemp, we've won, unanimous. It's gonna happen. It's happened here. You guys should be really proud of yourselves. And we're working to catch up. And I think we're going to get there real soon. And um, just keep keep going, you know. Just keep trucking. And uh, thanks to you. Thanks to this Hemp Fest. Thanks to these panelists. We're going to get it done. Honor President of Dr. Bronner's Magic Soaps. Um, we are a, a big financial sponsor of Vote Hemp and the Hemp Industries Association. Um, uh, but you know, our advocacy is across the board. We also are strong supporters of Americans for Safe Access, um, MPP, MAPS, and I'm on the board of MAPS. Um, but you know, with industrial hemp, we play it very. You know, industrial hemp has to you know succeed on its own merits, and we play it you know very straight. And because our coalition involves conservative farmers who want nothing to do with marijuana, and so you know we honor that. And uh, you know, we're making huge progress. Um, the hemp seed food markets are booming. Um, you know, basically, if you look at Canada, the amount of penetration hemp products have in mainstream stores, like for a long time, was not occurring here. But now it's just, you know, you, you can get Manitoba hemp nut in, in Costco. You know, it's really, yeah, we just have this like situation where uh, where we have like this huge Republican support all of a sudden manifesting more than the Democrats in the Senate. So I mean, we feel like we're very close. And then, like we got a, the first standalone federal can, cannabis-related legislation ever passed a few months ago with the House bill, the House Farm Bill. And so, you know, it's it's going to happen. And as soon as hemp goes in the ground, it's just going to be a whole new wave of, of entrepreneurship. As soon as hemp is in American soil again, it's just going to unlock just a whole another level. So, you know, I predict within two years, but. 
I wouldn't be surprised if it's within one that we're going to have industrial hemp recommercialized. My name is David Taylor, and I first uh, learned about industrial hemp half my lifetime ago, believe it or not. I was 21 years old, uh, learning about hemp, and ever since then, um, whenever I had the opportunity to introduce hemp into a conversation, I took advantage of that opportunity, okay? I used to own a hemp store in Washington, D.C., and we did have a tobacco shop as well on the premises. And because of a hemp store and a tobacco shop in one place, it was considered uh, intent that we, that it was clear that the people coming there were buying pipes for cannabis. This is what the police believed. But in the police's own uh, warrant to search the place, um, they actually described the difference between hemp and marijuana. They acknowledged that hemp clothing and body care and food products, you know, that even the oil for fuel, that those are all legitimate things, paper, and that this store had, has legitimate products made from hemp. But they somehow, one breath are saying hemp and marijuana not the same thing, we, got, we know that, and then another breath saying, well, but because it's there, it's clearly these pipes are for marijuana, they're for drugs. Even if they were, I, the ridiculousness of that uh, 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 allegation is is like saying that this mug right here, during the alcohol prohibition, is drug paraphernalia. Any container that any any apple, any piece of fruit, can be drug paraphernalia. You can take if you're desperate enough, you can take a newspaper and roll a joint out of a newspaper. Okay, everything can be drug paraphernalia, but. You know, we have such a ridiculous drug war going on that it even is taking out hemp stores. And that's gotta stop. And and we hope it will. I wanna make one more prediction and I'm gonna hand it off to David Bronner. I think the next president of the United States will end the war on marijuana once and for all at a federal level. I'm gonna make I'm not wishfully thinking here. The stars are aligning for this. And whatever candidate thinks they're the front runner right now, if they don't get their position on track with the rest of the, of the country, they will not be the front runner come 2016. Because we are getting too big, we are, are, we are maturing as a movement. The, our movements, I mean, many, I'm almost middle-aged now. I felt, I felt like a youngin when I first came in here. And you know, I'm getting middle-aged. So people are, the, the demographics are changing in this country and it's gonna be impossible for the next president to win without having a pro-cannabis position. And we're gonna hold them to that, right? Every one of us. Okay. Thank you. We can get at least 10 to 15 tons an acre every year. So over 60 years, you're talking about 600 or 1,000 tons, where all you got was 60 tons before. I think, again, this is a thing of orientation, of seeing how this is really going to work, of understanding how these industries, the dynamics that are in them, and that I believe it's possible to do both. To save our, to leave our forests alone, to let them regenerate, and to produce enough hemp to take care of a bunch of our needs and save a bunch of the problems that we have going on. So, question: uh, Is there any way this is a hemp food question for everyone to answer it? Uh, will we see the sale of? of Unshelled hemp seed any time in the future? Is should we see an end to this silly product? Uh, and can we just lose the term hemp nuts and get to hemp seed soon? Is that going to happen? Well, there, there's toasted hemp seed available. I mean, in the shells. In the shells, yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's not viable. I mean, like that's what's not available is the viable seeds um, that you could sprout. I mean. Hopefully, when we legalize, you know, recommercialize, you can get that. But right now, you can get toasted seeds, whole seeds. And FYI, right across, right next to the Dr. Bronner uh, hemp booth, is uh, Manitoba Harvest, and he probably has some in his booth right now. I also wanted to mention that the gentleman who, who talking about putting uh, hemp plants around trees. That's a great idea. I, I think that's that's brilliant. Uh, of course, the only problem is the legality, but I think that's really a good idea. Details, in my opinion. <laughs>
a question about um, Steve Sarich and Arthur West Point, which is that the Liquor Control Board of Washington didn't do a SEPA study, which is an Environmental Protection Act study reaching out to different agencies. What advice do you have for us now that we're going to be going into that process? I've heard there's things like, oh, the hemp crop will cross-pollinate with the marijuana cannabis and cause some problems. Whatever happened in Canada and how do we make that process go quickly, not take two years before they can launch 502? So, so if I understand the question, it's uh, the, there's a process underway to figure out the in environmental impact of cannabis with a particular concern on ruining the marijuana crop. Yeah, it's an interesting one. In California, we get it. We get it from the Emerald Triangle, and you know, we kind of have like a gentleman's agreement or something that you know we'll farm in the Central Valley and they'll grow in the Emerald Triangle. Um, I don't really think you can regulate it. Um, you know, it's, it's just got to kind of like agree. And this is a marijuana growing region. You don't really want to be planting fields of hemp and vice versa. I, I think it's also an issue of perspective. The truth of it is that there are any number of counties in California, Washington, or Oregon where if they were designated, for example, to grow recreational, medical, whatever you want to call it, could probably produce enough for the whole country. And there's 20 other states just like that. So that if in other areas, or even areas of those states, we allowed them to grow industrial. The truth of it is that it's not going to pollute. It's not. It, 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 it's an old wives issue, and that if we're going to be real about this and legalize and say that it's all good, we ought to make a variety like the Moroccans. They get their fiber and their medicinal out of the same variety. We need, you know. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a disciple of uh, Jack Herrer, who originally said we shouldn't separate these issues. There are different cultivars that we want to use for different purposes. But anybody who thinks that we're going to lose anything that way is looking at it from, from the wrong perspective. We've been repressed for so long that people don't understand the real productivity that agriculture that full-time unrestricted agriculture, whether it be uh, chemical or organic, really could represent to any one of these crops. And I think that's more important than worrying about one or two little instances where there might be a crossover. Yeah. Yeah, actually the hemp spread, the hemp pollen spread is about three miles according to the folks I talked to while I was doing drug war facts. That's David West and uh, a couple of folks up in, uh, up in uh, Canada. 